Welcome to the Rive Cast. It is Tuesday again, and I am super happy to see that you're joining us. Welcome everyone to ThriveCast. My name is Dr. Dominique Gumelt, and I am the Andrews University Director for Wellness. And I am so excited you're here with us today on the show. We have a phenomenal special guest today. Stay tuned. We're about to get started. I'm about to invite our guest onto the show. But for now, I would love to welcome you to Thrivecast, whoever you are, wherever you're from. Welcome. And please type into the chat where you're tuning in from. Um, are you from the United States? Are you from another country? I see Brazil is in the house. Fantastic. Wonderful. Who else do we have joining us today? Where are you from? Welcome, for, welcome, welcome. I see Dr. MJ, Elena is here. Um, I see D1632, welcome. Nice to see you. UK, Newbold College is here. Welcome, guys. I'm so glad you're here. This is Thrivecast every Tuesday, our show to help us to live our lives to the fullest potential. We are here to discuss how we can thrive more in our lives. And so today, our special guest and I will discuss one of the key foundational pieces of our Mate to Thrive philosophy at Andrews University. If you are a student at Andrews, you can get co-curricular credit for watching the show and being a part of the show. And at the end, we will put the link into the chat where you can go to obtain co-curricular credit, okay? So be here, stay here, invite your friends, invite your people down at the bottom, that little airplane paper plane thing, click on it and send it off so people can join us for this amazing guest that we have on our show today. Uh, last week, we had Ty Gibson on our show, and if you missed it, all the episodes can be found on IGTV on the Andrews University page. So go back, check it out, and uh, give us your feedback. We'd love to hear it. Okay, let me see. Hello, everyone. Where are you from? Nice to see you. Wherever you're tuning in from, type it into the chat so we can see where you're joining from. And while we are watching you, I am super excited to announce our guest for the show today. This guest... And I have known each other for a few years, and it's been my greatest privilege to work with him together on a number of really, really important projects together. Um, I have learned to really respect this man who has made a phenomenal difference in the communities that he's lived in, that he's worked in. And I am just super thrilled that he's taking time out of his busy schedule to talk with me today on Thrivecast. So welcome with me to our show today, Michael Nixon, and I'm going to pull him into the show right about now, popping in any second. Welcome, Ben. Welcome, Talitha. Gabriel, nice to see you. All right, we're, well, we're waiting for the connection. There, I feel like it's coming in. Yay! Hey, can you Hello. hear me? <laughs> it's good to see you, Michael. Good to see you too. How's it going, Dominique? Good. Can it sound good? Can we hear each other well? I can hear you good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you good as well. Fantastic. Awesome. Perfect. You know, this is crazy, Michael, because I'm sitting here in a little place in Germany and you are sitting in a little place in Michigan. <laughs> and yet we yeah. can talk. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the, the power of the internet. It's been amazing. And we've, of course, been using it a lot more during this, these seasons of life. And so I'm glad to be able to connect with you here on IG. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time. This is a very, very crazy time for everyone. Um, I always like to say whether or not we realize it, but we're all living in massive times of change. And that change has meant different things to different people. And, um, and so I'm super excited for us to chat a little bit about really, truly um, how, despite the circumstances that we may find ourselves in personally, um, socially, as a country, wherever we are, what can yeah. we do to thrive more? And so that's, you know, something we want to talk about today. But before that, Michael, tell us something about yourself. So the viewers that are here, which by the way, we have an international audience today. Um, tell them, who are you? What do you do? And tell us something about yourself. 
Sure. Well, again, thank you for having me on. Uh, again, my name is Michael Nixon, and I serve as the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion here at Andrews. Uh, I'm in my fourth year in that role. It's kind of amazing to think that it's been going into four years, going on four years already now. Really? Um, yeah, but but it's been a, it's been a really interesting ride, a really interesting journey. And one thing about myself, um, uh, I know we have a well. This isn't really international, but it's um, uh, it's a, a broader perspective on the states. I did spend my first year of uh, college at. Antillian Adventist University in Puerto Rico. And so, I did not know out. that. That's news yeah. to me, too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, way back when, well, not too long ago, I was 17 years old as a freshman. Uh, I'm not that old, so it wasn't too long ago. <laughs> so. But, um, yeah, had a had a great time. So shout out to anybody in here from PR. Um, that's maybe one little known fact about me, I guess I can share. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And uh, and Michael, you have a lovely wife and a lovely daughter. Yes. Yes. Uh, my wife's Tassiana and my daughter, Noah Nixon. Uh, that's N-O-A. Uh, she's five and um, she's, well, five going on 15 and is really <laughs> excited about kindergarten right now and, and all that good stuff. And so she she definitely keeps us busy, to say the least, for sure. That, but it's a, it's a joy to that's uh, fantastic. parent her. I have I've enjoyed uh, watching Noah over the years, and she's a sparkle. I mean, oh, really. she is, she <laughs> is. She she definitely runs the household for sure. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So so Michael, I um I every guest that comes on the show, I ask that guest the same three questions. So um I'm gonna ask just some random questions and try to answer them just like in one minute. It's not really a game show, but we're kind sure. of playing a little game, I suppose. <laughs> Sounds so, good. Sounds okay. good. Yeah. Okay. So, are you ready? Yep. yep. Okay. So, first question is: What is your favorite fruit, and why? Ah, favorite fruit. Um, I'd probably say mangoes. I really like a good ripe mango. It has to be not not a you know you gotta. So, what we would do? My mother, of course, she's fr she's born in Jamaica. And so we would buy the mangoes in season, hopefully from the store, and you put them in a brown paper bag and you sort of leave them in the kitchen so they can get more ripe. Okay. And so you wait, you wait until not too juicy to the point where they're, you know, not ripe anymore, but just on the brink of it no longer being ripe and it's nice and juicy and you can slice them up and, or you can just rip off the skin and dig in. I love a, I love a really good ripe mango. You, you know, it's so interesting. I love when people answer these questions because we literally learn more special things about how to, you know, mm. eat fruit and how different yeah. places do it. I love that. It's so great. Fantastic. Yeah, okay, so sure. mangoes. So this is good. For all the people who are here listening, we already learned something. Mangoes are good for you and you can eat them in that way. Yep. <laughs> so, Absolutely. So that's good. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, next question is, describe your current mood today right now using yeah. weather metaphor oh yeah this is a this is a good question I, we use this question actually a lot when we do our story circles on campus okay. for through our, our truth racial healing and transformation campus center and so it, it's a interesting one and and as you're asking it now i'm i'm obviously buying myself time to process my answer um i'd say well it's a it's a pretty typical cloudy day here in, in Berrien Springs. I know you know them well. We're yes. in that sort of fall turning into winter sort of a season here. Um, and so I'd say I'm feeling a bit similar. We're just kind of getting towards the end of the semester and things are getting pretty busy and, you know, dealing with some other things. And there's just like a lot right now. And so I'd say it's a bit of a cloudy, overcast uh, fall day but there is some beauty breaking through there with the colors of the leaves and stuff like that. And so you just have to try to cling to, to those pieces of it. I love that. I love that analogy. Um, here in Germany, actually, right now, it's very similar, the weather mm. to or the seasons to Michigan. But here it doesn't get quite as crazy cold. So uh, we're, it's still a little bit warmer, but the leaves are changing. And like you say, you always have this cloud cover, but then you have the beauty of of the colors that come through. So I love that analogy. Thanks for Great. sharing that. Sure, sure. <laughs> no, that's good. 
So um, we're about to dive into, you know, some questions, but I just want to, for those of you that are watching for the first time, or maybe you haven't been on Thrivecast, so we believe here at Andrews University that every single person has been made extraordinary and that every single person has been made to thrive. And we've discussed over the last weeks what that means. We've broken that down a little bit. We talked about um, what it means that we're made to matter and what it means that we're made to unwind and made to move. And so we, and, and we, we talk about, um, you know, made to dream last week. It was a fantastic conversation. And so today we want to talk about an essential component of living your life to the fullest potential and living well. And that is the component of made to be long. And I find it so fascinating um, you know, really, if we dive deep into it, we only have a few minutes, but um, I want to start out with that question, Michael, when you hear, you know, made to be long, what does that really mean? What does that mean to you? How would you interpret that? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, you know, made, made to belong, really encompassing the social well-being component of our model in made to thrive. And so, uh, before I dive into sort of how it resonates with me, I'll just share real quick a snippet of that helps to maybe paint a picture of what that looks like. Yeah. And we share this in our model. And so what we say there is to imagine creating a world where conversations are encouraged, differences are embraced, and help is freely offered, turning strangers into neighbors. Mm -hmm. That is the power of inclusion. Mm. And so from my perspective, um, you know, I like painting pictures and, and sort of, because I think when it comes to belonging, you know, a lot of people try to get get um, really tied into what is the formula or, you know, what's the one plus one equals two, which leads to belonging or inclusion. And from my perspective, I believe that belonging is much more of a posture. Mm -hmm. And so I, I believe that what belonging looks like to me is creating an environment where everyone who's in that environment um, gets the signals from those who are a part of cultivating that environment, which says that I matter, that I belong, yeah. that, that my um, opinion is valued and included, and that I'm not just being tolerated, but I'm being integrated into what is happening here at the institution. So here at Andrews, you know, what that means for students, and you know, for example, is that when they're in the classroom, they are seeing within the curriculum stories that reflect their experience that they yeah. can connect with. Yeah. As, as much as we are trying to stretch people and our students' understanding and perspectives on things, we're also working to help them to reinforce and understand that I'm a part of this story and this narrative as well. Mm -hmm. And so for our, for our employees, that means that we are doing what is necessary to pour into them and, and for professional development and uh, making sure that they're not just seen as a person who is, you know, called to do a particular task, but that they are a broader part of our campus community and that mm -hmm. that goes beyond just what's on their job description. And, and we go, we create an environment where people can go deeper uh, yeah. in their connections and in their relationships and, and that they ultimately are, are able to understand and, and see how uh, where I am now can set me up for where I want to go and mm -hmm. how I, I really see belonging as key to a lot of the other uh, components of the, the, the personal well-being characteristics because um, it's hard to dream in a space where I feel like I don't belong. You know, yes. It, yes. it's hard to feel like I matter if I'm being told that I don't belong here, That's right. you know, and That's so right. and, and they all work together. So 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 uh, clearly. And so um, I, I just think that it's really important for us to um, not just with our words as an institution, but with our actions, re reinforce and, mm -hmm. and reiterate the fact that everyone does belong. Everyone is included uh, and everyone has a part to play in the broader uh, narrative and story that makes Andrews uh, the wonderful place that it is. Mm -hmm. I love how you describe that. And I love how you paint that picture so nicely, the way you just use those words to really paint that picture big, because, you know, while it maybe sounds so simple, made mm. to be long, it's really not simple at all. Yeah. Um, you know, every single human, I think has, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel every single human has this innate need to want to be long. 
Sure. Sure. No, absolutely. I, I think that's definitely the case. And I think that um, in every aspect of life, we're all striving to ensure that we are in a environment where we're valued, where yes. um, where we're welcomed, that we're not just being tolerated, you yeah. know, that when and then and then when something is making us feel as if we don't belong, that it's not just rebuffed or put to the side. And yeah. that and that's where, you know, aspects like made to speak and things like that come into play. And I know you'll you'll talk about that in, in later episodes, but um I, I think that we both need to create an environment where people understand that um this is the place where they can clarify what it means to belong and, and to also understand what it means to make sure others feel as if they belong because it can't just be me centered uh, it has to be um you know i'm able to belong best in an environment where others also belong yes. and also are included and the yes. more that i make space for others that innately can make space for myself as well but if we are all just zeroed in on well how do i craft out space for myself then that could actually work to exclude others as mm -hmm. opposed to ensuring that everyone is included. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, as you were talking just now, I was thinking, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's so, our world has become so integrated. I mean, we can now go places, different cultures can visit each other. I mean, the, things have, you know, it's very different. And especially in the United States, the United States really, you know, so many people come from different places. I mean, when I moved to the United States from another country, you know, I really went through also this experience. How do I belong here? You know, and it's so it's yeah. a, such a complex experience that you're going through because you're trying to understand the narrative yourself that you find yourself in. You're trying to find how you really do belong. And I love what you just said that it's about also value. There's this value piece that has to be there. Um, it's not just a matter of saying, okay, well, I can eat the same food or I can, you know, dance the same dance, but yeah. belonging is a much deeper issue than that. And I, I'm curious, you know, in your journey, um, as you've been really um, studying and really, uh, really diving into the subject, because I mean, this is what you do on a day in, day out now, but do you recall um, any particular aha moment that you had related to, you know, belonging, inclusion, that really helped you with your perspective that might help someone else? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I think that my, my journey really started while I was in law school. And so I, I went to the UIC John Marshall Law School in Chicago, uh, where I got my JD. And uh, while I was there, um, I got exposed to a number of different areas of the law and really developed a passion for civil rights and advocacy. And mm -hmm. so during my the second half of my second year and then my third year there, I worked at my school's Fair Housing Legal Clinic. And uh, one of the things that we had a privilege of doing while being there was actually being able to represent some clients under the supervision of an attorney. And so um, I'll never forget that uh, one of the um, my, my first case, actually, that I was able to try in front of a um, administrative law judge um, in the City Commission for Human Rights in Chicago was on behalf of a of a, was on behalf of a gay couple mm -hmm. in Chicago who was uh, attempting to rent an apartment, and um, everything was fine. They qualified for the apartment, and everything was was you know going okay. But it came to the day when they were to sign the lease for the apartment and uh, the the person who had been doing the majority of the negotiations brought his spouse around along with him and immediately the landlord shut down and, you know, no longer wanted to rent to them. And so for me, um, it was it was very shocking to hear that kind of a story happen because Oftentimes when we hear, when we have these conversations, particularly in religious settings about um, whether or not different people should be included around, you know, our church or our organization or whatever the case may be, um, it can be very abstract and, you know, very theoretical. But when you start to think about how those conversations affect actual people, yes. and in the case of my, the case that I was working on, just the ability of folks to be able to gain housing 
Yeah. Uh, my my perspective started to shift on what it meant to mm-hmm. create areas of belonging and inclusion. So yeah. to wrap up that story, we were thankfully able to uh, secure uh, some monetary relief for those persons who'd been denied housing, and they were subsequently able to find an even better apartment Good. in a better neighborhood and building where they were mm-hmm. welcomed. Yes. And so um, that, that stuck with me, though, because it, it reminded me that, you know, a lot of times these conversations that we have around even diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a lot deeper than your personal opinion or conviction. Yes. Uh, you know, we're, we're all striving to figure out how can we all across areas of difference create a space yes. where we can belong, where we can yes. have value, and where sometimes we may agree or disagree on a particular issue, we should never disagree on the fact that everybody should have a place where they belong and where they can call home. Yeah. So that was a huge aha moment and mm-hmm. eye opener for me yeah. that is, you know, sort of pushed me on the trajectory now of seeking to advocate on behalf of others. I love that. Thank you for sharing that story. That was really significant because exactly what you said, I think so often, and I think many of us have done that and many of us mm. do that, whenever, whatever the situation or issue might be, we fail to really start looking at it more objectively and on a bigger scale because we're always focused on, you know, our tunnel and our thing that we're in. And ultimately, you know, we react out of our own fears and of our own lack of understanding, our, out of our own ignorance. And we often don't realize what type of impact. And I will just be bold to say long-term damage you can do yeah. by even just one statement to a person. Yeah. And I mean, we, we, you know, we could go in so many different directions here. I mean, no matter from what perspective you're saying that from, I mean, right. you could start, you could start talking about the kid in school um, that gets bullied for being overweight or whatever. Yeah. The point is, the point is whatever we do out of our own fears and insecurities, and while we think that our reactions might maybe protect our safe place, it can have a much bigger impact on the recipient of that that story. And so I think one of the things that stood out to me from your story is when we think about thriving and for us to thrive and creating a community that thrives, it is vital that we start understanding that these subjects we're talking about, while in theory might be, uh, you know, simplistic to some people, in reality, they have a huge impact and we're not even close to really, you know, having these conversations solved anywhere close to it. And so I thank you for that example. That, that was really brilliant. And actually, sure. um, tag, tagging on to, you know, what you said and, and also what your specialty um, has become and your passion and your interest and where you're working. Um, I, I, do have, I do have a question that I have written down. So I'm going to actually look at my notes, too, because I want to pose that sure. correctly. Um, but based on your role that you just described at Andrews University and the roles that you've had and the scope of your work that you do, suppose the problem of structural racism were to disappear from the world, or maybe Berrien County, where you're working mm-hmm. and living in, um, sure. overnight. If that was the case, wow. what would Made to Belong look like? Wow. Well, well, first of all, that, that's a beautiful thought and idea of that disappearing overnight. I would, I would take that any day of the week. Uh, but if that were to be the case, um, we would obviously celebrate that. We would be excited that the globe has really come to the realization of the effects and ills of structural, systemic, institutional racism and that it's been eradicated. But what I would also be hoping and I'd be looking for is, have we dealt with sexism? You know, have we dealt with religious bigotry? Have we dealt with LGBTQIA plus inclusion? Have we dealt with disability rights? Uh, Have we dealt with uh, ensuring that there is a diversity of perspectives and diversity of thought included in our conversations? Um, Have we dealt with xenophobia and nationalism, uh, religious bigotry, whatever the case may be? Um, and, And that's not to look at things from a negative frame, but it's just to understand that Um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion umbrella is a large one. And there are lots of different uh, belonging issues that we need to pay attention to. Uh, For us in religious community, what does it mean to be a non-religious person at Andrews? Or whether that's on our main campus or studying around the world, what does that look like for 
someone who is from a different religious perspective, you yeah. know? Uh, how do we ensure that we are still obviously uplifting and upholding of our particular beliefs and perspectives while not alienating those who come from a different perspective? And so uh, well, what I would say is that, you know, the eradication of structural racism, that would be great, but, but the work could not stop there because the work that we're doing now is, is not just focused on racism, although that's a, a vitally important issue for us to address and will continue to. But there's so many other uh, pieces of that. And, and we try to structure our Institutional Diversity and Inclusion Action Council to look at a lot of those different areas of the campus that need to be addressed beyond mm -hmm. structural racism. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. And I love how you really bring more light into this conversation because I think oftentimes when people hear certain words, of course, everyone has associations with words and based right. on their own experiences, but that this, that what we're talking about is such a big scope because it includes so, so many different areas and, you know, right. different people with, you know, different scenarios. I mean, you and I have talked about that, you know, I've shared with you too, you know, um, being a woman and what does that mean, uh, you know, in the, right. in the working world, in society, and you know I mean uh, there are so many things there and you know what I would love um, to see if you could share with us and with the viewers and by the way everyone who's tuned in welcome to Thrivecast this is Dr. Michael Nixon I'm Dominique Melt and we're talking about made to belong and um, what I would love to know Michael is if you could pick three things that you could say to our listeners about either ways of thought, of behavior that could contribute to, let's just say, the improvement or the progress within this conversation, what could some things be that everyone could intentionally, actively do or change about the way they think or how they do that could be helpful? Yeah, great question. Um, I think the first thing that I would say, and this is something that my colleague, Dr. Carol Wolford Hunt, also says a lot, and she was the creator of our diversity, equity, and inclusion training program called Mirror, is that we, her, her and I, we really believe in the power of self-discovery. Mm -hmm. And we believe that the first step in belonging and creating spaces where people can belong is to really understand and discover yourself okay. and understand what it is you're bringing to the table. So, I mean, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, I, I really like some different personality indexes. My favorite is the Enneagram. We don't have time okay. to go super in depth into that, but okay. there's also there's also Strengths Quest. There's Myers Briggs. I mean, there's lots of other different you know things that folks can use to help them start on the process of understanding. Okay, what am I bringing to the table? How has the environment and community that I've been brought up in shaped the way that I think and the way that I yeah. feel? and the way that I see the world so that when I start to move into some more different crucial conversations, I can understand maybe why that resonates with me in a certain way, whereas other things may not. So yeah. I think self-discovery is really important. Uh, another thing is to really intentionally engage across areas of differences. We're, we're living in a time right now where it's really, really easy to just really hunker down into your silo. I was actually telling you, Dominique, uh, thankfully that you um, had texted me yesterday about us having this conversation today because I've actually been in the middle of a little bit of a social media fast. And I see. Has it, it hasn't been for that long. It's only been like a week and a half thus far, and, and it probably won't last for super long. But um, I did it for a number of reasons, but we do know that social media itself in general has a really strange way of just bunkering you into a bit of a silo where now yeah. you're not engaging as much with folks that um, have a different opinion. Or if you are, they're likely people that are very volatile and aren't really there to have a productive conversation. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of volatility in our culture. And so um, we need to approach better ways to engage with people respectfully yeah. across areas of difference. And so within our a learning educational community here at Andrews, we're trying to create some intentional ways for people to do that in a respectful manner, because I think it's becoming a bit of a lost art where people just aren't uh, engaging respectfully and um, 
and and with any sort of real value across areas of difference and it's becoming much more about the us versus you know you or, or yeah. us versus yeah. them kind of a thing right and then the last thing that i would say is to to make sure and this is maybe just goes to the whole broader idea of you know thriving and and being and being made to thrive is uh to focus on what makes you come alive mm -hmm. um i i i gained that thought from a really powerful quote from the reverend dr howard thurman for those who don't know him he was a mentor to reverend dr martin luther king was one of his professors he actually yeah. himself went to a uh, university with dr king's father uh, he would often tell students that he was mentoring who were coming to him for um, for different advice or trying to figure out what it is that they were supposed to do with their life and things of that nature. And Dr. Thurman would say to them, don't ask yourself what the world needs, because we oftentimes think about, well, what's the need in the world that I can fill? I want to be a world changer. And that's important. And we need to fill needs in the world. But he's saying at the beginning, at the start, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Mm -hmm. Because what the world because what the world needs are people who have come alive. Mm -hmm. And so when we focus on our purpose and our calling and, and really lean into what it is that God has called us to do or that we feel that we've been called to do in the world, uh, in the globe, uh, we will find ourselves doing that thing that the world has needed that nobody mm -hmm. else could have done. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's not about becoming a cookie cutter or things of that nature, but it's focusing on what makes me come alive. And I think in doing that, we're actually doing the most that we can do ourselves in creating a space where we can belong yeah. because we belong in the space doing things that we've been called to do that make us come alive, that really uh, will call and um, awaken others to that same kind of a calling. So Absolutely. Uh, those, are, those are three quick things that I would mention there. Brilliant. And I actually saw that our amazing assistant, Denard, just captured that in the chat for everybody to, to see. And he wrote it down. And I love somebody right. wrote here, uh, Dango, official passion and purpose. Exactly. That's what we were talking about. And you know, it's so brilliant because the conversation last week with Ty Gibson, we talked about mate to dream. And we exactly were zoning mm. into that point is you need to find your passion. Why would you spend one more day doing something you're not passionate about just to fill some type of a need. Yeah. But 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 as as we know, if we are not okay with ourselves, if we're not living um, our passions with all the gifts that we've been given and are utilizing these things, then we're not going to be happy. Then we're not going to be content, and that's also going to spread be projected to you know the world around us. And right. uh, I love Absolutely. how you say that because, you know, this idea of, you know, when you accept yourself, you have a much greater chance to, you know, accept accepting somebody else also, you know, right. for who they are. And, uh, right. and no, those were great three points. I loved it. It was really, really good. I hope you all watching captured that because uh, I think there are some good practical tips here. I mean, the first one, of course, if you haven't ever done it, go check, uh, do a personality test. You know, um, Dr. Nixon gave us a few options here, of course, uh, to do. And it's, you know, it's, it can be quite fun to really do that because, you know, you're like, wow, okay, yeah, I totally see how that, you know, I'm like, oh, I was not aware of that. And that's what it's about, is yeah. getting, to know, getting to know yourself, you know? So I love that. And, you know, that question about what are you really passionate about? What makes you come alive? And lastly, when we talked with Ty about this, we realized, you know, I think many of us don't even know what that is because we've never asked that question. Because yeah. we all just do, and you said that earlier, because we're all growing up in some type of context environment and we exist within a context and environment and we often just react to everything around us, not asking ourselves if this is what makes me come alive or not. Yeah, and, and I'll just say real quick, you know, um, speaking of, and, and that last part, the reason why I shared is because it's been one of the more difficult questions for me to ask myself. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, re really, really 30 seconds on the Enneagram. So there are nine different types. I'm a nine. And the, the word that they use for a nine is a peacemaker. And uh, there's lots of different great attributes about being a peacemaker. But one of the really critical things for peacemakers is to understand the difference between peacemaking and peacekeeping. Peacekeeping can be really non-confrontational and silent. And we oftentimes think of peace as that way. 
but peacemaking can actually be somewhat noisy at first in order to get to the kind of peace that's necessary. And so oftentimes in my peacekeeping, I have asked the question, well, what do those around me want and what will keep the peace, quote unquote, with yeah. them, yep. you yeah. know, and, and thinking that, well, that's going to make them feel like they belong more if I just kind of go along with their flow, not understanding and realizing that that's actually a false belonging, that's actually a false peace, and that in order to make peace, I need to assert and say, no, this is what makes me come alive. This is actually what I've been called to do. This is what I want in this moment. And I have to honor that because if, not, if I'm not honoring that, then I'm not honoring those that are around me and, and creating an environment where they can actually truly belong. So that's why, again, that self-discovery is just so important because now yeah. I have to put in intentional mechanisms to make sure that I am being more assertive because I can easily sort of fall back yeah. and keep a false peace as opposed to making true peace. I love it. That is so vital. I just, I always like, I captured those type of statements. That was good. <laughs> right, <laughs> because right. it really, I mean, it really was. And it's so rich. And I hope that everyone watching can really process this because um, what we're talking about today requires some serious action on our part, on our individual part. And that's what thriving is about. You cannot thrive in theory. You can only thrive in action, and it requires us to do things. Um, and uh, and so, uh, anyways, thank you for that. Are you still with us, Michael? I think you just froze. Did I? And uh, can, but can I you hear me? He's coming back. Can you coming hear me? Back. Yeah, you're back. Okay, sorry. You're yeah. back. You're good. Right. No, very good. Okay, well. Just as we um, as we, we talk about this this issue of the, or this idea of thriving and why it's so vital, I think it's more vital now than ever for so many different reasons. And um, I actually, my assistant, he was so nice and he wrote down a couple of questions today for you. And one of them I loved. And so that's a, a basic question. But um, can you? Okay, so okay, I should say this. You and I have talked about it a lot. We both love sports. We're both we're we yep. both love sports, and I know you're a sure. big sports fan. Sure. So, sure. so if you if you had to pick um, an athlete that you maybe admire, or someone that you know has been an idol of some sort or a mentor or whatever as you grow, um, what athlete do you believe encompasses or fits the definition of a thriver? Wow, it's an excellent question. And, and, I, and I know that your assistant, Denard, was hoping that I was going to choose him as my <laughs> thriving athlete. That's right. Um, he, he, he may be some, he's somewhere on the honorable mentions list, potentially, uh, but didn't quite make the cut. Um, I, I would say that the, um, the athlete that really comes to mind as a thriver and someone that I've looked up to, uh, I'm actually a pretty big baseball fan. I'm a huge Yankee fan. Um, and so I'm a little sad that we're not in the World Series, but hey, that's a different discussion. Uh, <laughs> but my my favorite athlete from the Yankees growing up was Derek Jeter. Um, he was just the consummate professional. Um, the thing with Jeter that I always loved is that he was just um, – I'd never heard him make an excuse about anything his entire career, whether it was an injury or a loss or whatever it was. He took full accountability for it. And any time he won, he'd act like he'd been there before. And right after there was a win, he would celebrate it a little bit, but immediately would just transition to saying, we have another season to prepare for. And it's kind of like the next thing up. And so um, just his commitment to his craft and the fact that he was in the media fishbowl of New York, but um, made sure that uh, he kept things you know, with his family private and things of that nature as well. Um, he really encompassed thriving. And then, of course, now he's a team owner. He's an owner of the okay. uh, Miami Marlins. And so he, he moved beyond just being a player now into ownership where he can cultivate young players now as well. Right. Okay. And so, uh, that yeah, that's the one who comes to mind. There's so many others, but that he rates to the top for me. That's great. I love it. It's so good to hear, you know, the, the type of people that we look to and that we observe. And, uh, and I think some people might want to look that up and, and read sure. you know, the story about Derek Jeter and, you know, yeah. um, what he's done and how he's done it. Like you said, you know, he is somebody who always looked just to get a little bit better, to improve, to look forward and not just be content with some kind of a status quo or some type of a thing that 
you can just bathe and just say, okay, that's it, you know, good enough. Because at yeah. the end of the day, you can go for, and then to take the responsibility, then to give back and all those things he's experienced, all the things he learned, all the skills he acquired to pass that on, to mentor, to coach, and to lead other people. I think that is an amazing um, way to go about. And I think we need more of yeah. that. Um, yeah, and, I, and, I'll just, and I'll just add real quick. He's actually from Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is not too far from here. And one of the things that he mentioned uh, that I drew, drew to early in his career, of course, in baseball, you start in the minor leagues. And he was in a um, he was in a, a situation where he was really struggling. So this is before any of us had heard about it. This is before he was called up to the majors. And he was actually seriously considering quitting. Okay. Um, and, and but so he had a critical conversation with his parents and – they basically said, hey, just give it another week or just give it a little bit more time uh, before you give up on your dream. And it was in that next period of time that something clicked for him. And mm. then as he was working harder and going deeper, that he, he just started to cultivate the skills that uh, propelled him to be, you know, one of the greatest players of all time. And so I oftentimes think to myself, what if he in that phone call would have decided I'm going to quit? We would have never heard of him. Uh, the right. Yankees organization probably wouldn't have won those multiple yeah. championships they won. Um, it really would have changed the trajectory of history. And so Crazy. it just reminds me that in those critical moments, we just have to keep pushing a little bit more uh, until we get that breakthrough. I love that. That is, I was going to give you the final word, but I really feel like that was the final word because it was really, Great. that was the inspiration right there. I love that. Absolutely. Sure. And, um, and so just a couple of sh two word, two quick words to our viewers today. Um, if you are a student at Andrews University and you were here, thank you so much. Um, if you want co-curricular credit, the link to that is in the bio on the Andrews Instagram account. So you can click on there to fill out for co-curricular credit. And you can actually also get co-curricular credit for watching the past episodes on the YouTube or IGTV as well. So go check that out if you want to do it. I think your life will be enriched by listening to the wonderful guests that have been contributing as we've been talking about all these um, different subjects. And if you're a viewer from around the world, thank you for taking your time to being here with us. Um, we really want to connect more with the global community that we have. And um, we are excited to continue Thrivecast uh, during this first season of this show. Next week, however, on Tuesday, November 3rd, we will not have Thrivecast. As in the United States, it will be election day. And so we will take a, a break next week and we will commence in two weeks um, from today with Thrivecast. And my final word today is, Michael, that I want to thank you, um, not just for being on the show, but I thank you for that as well and for sharing your stories and sharing some of your personal stories, your wisdom, your experience, and for all that you do. I'm not sure that sometimes that comes through, but on behalf of everyone I know and I work with, um, this place is a much better place because of your work, what you do, and like you say, how you do peace making is something that we have needed and we need desperately and so i just want to affirm you and thank you in all that you do and to not get thank tired you. of that because we need you so Great. Well, <laughs> well thank you dominique it's a pleasure working with you and thank you for all that you do you're a treasure to our community and so keep it up thank you so much and with sure. that we send many greetings to wherever you are in the world and we'll see you in two weeks bye-bye take care